Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I am Faraz Nakhvi and I am here associated with the Iraq program of Institute of Regional Studies Islamabad. And uh, today we are gathered to have a important discussion on a very imperative topic, which is the recent uh, visit of IAEA Chief General Rafael Grossi to Iran and the developments that uh, subsequently prevailed between uh, IAEA and Iran. So uh, during the visit, let me have the brief uh, background. During the vi visit, it was highlighted that Iran has already enriched the uranium by 83%, which is just a little less to achieve the nuclear threshold. But uh, as the talks progressed between Iran and IAEA, so it was decided that Iran would allow the enhanced uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, mechanism and activities and verification mechanism by IAEA and would comply with the international nuclear uh, laws being the signatory of NPT. Uh, however, it is uh, also likely uh, and it is also feared that such sort of uh, uh, negotiations and such sort of uh, proceedings between Iran and IAEA could be sabotaged by uh, some external threats uh, as we have already witnessed that Iran has been facing some uh, attacks on its nuclear sites. But uh, having said that, uh, I think it is quite imperative and quite important that the renewed round of talks between IAEA and Iran has taken place, uh, which has uh, given the precedence of, uh, uh, of enhanced uh, trust uh, between the two uh, entities. Having said that, to uh, de deliberate upon this uh, important topic, we we have three distinguished speakers. Two of them are from Pakistan and one of them is from uh, Iran. So uh, coming directly to our first speaker, uh, Ambassador Ali Sarwar Nakhvi. Uh, Ambassador Ali Sarwar Nakhvi served for 36 years from 1970 to 2006 as a diplomat, which culminated in senior ambassadorial positions, including in United Nations, both in New York and Vienna, Washington DC, London, Paris, and Brussels. He has also served as Pakistan ambassador to Austria and permanent uh, representative to IAEA and was appointed as the chairman advisory council in Pakistan's Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, currently, Ambassador Ali Sarwar Nakhvi is uh, serving as the founding executive director of Center for International Security Studies, a Islamabad based think tank who uh, conduct research on nuclear and technological affairs. He is also the distinguished visiting fellow in the National Defense University, Islamabad, since 2010. And he is also associated with various Pakistan research institutes since November 2009. Today, Ambassador Nakhvi would be speaking on the um, IAEA role as a third party, as a mediator between Iran and the uh, and the West, particularly the US. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Faraz. It's a very great pleasure and uh, a privilege to speak today on this very important subject in uh, uh, on the forum of the uh, Institute of Regional Studies, uh, which is a sister uh, think tank in uh, Slava. Uh, I am uh, happy to be uh, able to uh, outline for you uh, the IAEA diplomatic engagement uh, as third party in the uh, JCPOA. Now, this subject is of particular interest to me personally as I served as Pakistan's ambassador to the IAEA during the, the period in which the Iranian program came under IAEA scrutiny. I served in the IAEA from 2001 to 2006, and I was on the board of governors when the Iranian program came under the IAEA purview. An interesting aspect of the IAEA's consideration of the Iran program uh, was the fact that I saw the IAEA transform into an investigative agency, which had hitherto, hitherto been basically a promotional body. Its principal mandate was and is to promote the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, power, agriculture, medicine, biosciences, biotechnology, and a number of other peaceful uses 
uh, of, of uh, this important uh, uh, and a source energy source. Then came the issues of Iran, Libya, and North Korea during my tenure in uh, Vienna, in which cases the Security Council mandated the IAEA to investigate the nuclear programs of these countries to ascertain if they are diverting nuclear material to military uses. Due to this mandated function, the IAEA also turned political. In, uh, even if its leadership, the DG and senior officers of the body, uh, tried to maintain uh, their neutrality. In Iran's case, the IAEA performed its role through diplomatic engagement with the parties involved. Iran on one side, the EU and later P5 plus one on the other, to bring about a clear uh, understanding and uh, uh, a clear uh, picture regarding Iran's nuclear program. I mean, Iran was never uh, considered to be in violation of its obligations. But there were some doubts and suspicions about its nuclear program. Now, this is very tricky. You see, the, uh, nuclear energy is a dual-use uh, energy. So, uh, there can always be doubts and suspicions if there is a lack of trust. And I think this is the basic problem uh, in this entire situation uh, in regard to Iran. There were two phases of the consideration of the Iran program. The first from 2002 to about 2003 or late uh, three and early four, when it was taken up by the IAEA itself. And uh, I was there when the board of governors used to uh, uh, take up the Iranian nuclear program and uh, the reports of the inspectors. Uh, when the agency could not satisfy itself entirely, the major uh, European countries and the United States took it upon themselves to treat this issue at the political level. That was the beginning of the EU3, France, Germany, and UK, focus on Iran's program, which later converted into a larger group of P5 plus one, which means the five permanent members of the Security Council and chairman. Now, I will now give you a quick rundown of the developments in this context for you to gain an insight into the issue. Iran, uh, Iran's journey from acquiring peaceful nuclear technology to developing uh, 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 other, other uh, I would not say uh, a nuclear uh, weapons program, but uh, into other areas which uh, raise doubts and suspicions. Iran got its first nuclear reactor in 1959. The U.S. supplied five megawatt Tehran research reactor, TRR, to Iran, uh, which became critical in November 1967. In 1970, the Iranian parliament ratified the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, NPT. So Iran became a member of the NPT. In 1974, Raza Shah Pahlavi, the ruler of Iran at that time, established the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, uh, AEOI, uh, -E and announced plans to generate about 23,000 megawatts of energy over 20 years, including the construction of 23 nuclear power plants and the development of a full nuclear site. In 1979, as we all know, <laughs> The Iranian Revolution and the seizure of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran resulted in a severing of a break of U.S.-Iranian ties and uh, damaged Iran's relationship with uh, all Western countries. Iran nuclear projects were halted. The National Council of Resistance, now here comes the next uh, stage. 
the National Council of Resistance on Iran, the political wing of the Mujahideen, Mujahideen Khalq, uh, held a press conference uh, in uh, uh, 2002 and declared Iran had built nuclear facilities in near Natanz and Arab. On September 12, 2003, the IAEA Board of Governors adopted a resolution calling for Iran to suspend all enrichment and reprocessing related activities. The resolution required Iran to declare all material relevant to its uranium enrichment program and allow IAEA inspectors to conduct environmental sampling at any location. The resolution required Iran to meet its conditions by October 31st, 2003. On October 21, 2003, Iran agreed to meet IAEA demands by the October 31st deadline. And in a deal struck between Iran and the European foreign ministers, the Iran agreed to suspend the uranium enrichment activities and ratify an additional protocol requiring Iran to provide an expanded declaration of its nuclear activities and granting the IAEA broader rights of access to sites in the country. However, the Iran IAEA cooperation, uh, which, which uh, was working so far, uh, did not uh, uh, did not satisfy the members of the Board of Governors, especially the Western countries. And uh, the, 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 the uh, entire uh, case of Iran was then uh, taken over by, uh, at the political level uh, by the, by, uh, the uh, European countries in the first instance. At the heart of the negotiations with Iran were, of course, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council and Germany, collectively known as the P5 and 1. And the European Union was part. Now, this led to negotiations and detailed discussions for almost 12 years, from 2003 to 2015 which resulted in the JCPOA, the Joint, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Under its terms, Iran agreed to dismantle much of its nuclear program and open its facilities to more extensive international inspections to exchange in exchange for, in exchange for billions of dollars worth of sanctions relief. These sanctions had starved Iranian economy uh, of more than $100 billion in revenues from 2012 to 2014 alone, just the few years before the JCPOA was signed. The JCPOA, which went into effect in January 2016, imposed restrictions on Iran's uh, enrichment program. The P5 and plus one wanted to unwind Iran's nuclear program to the point that if Tehran decided to pursue a nuclear weapon uh, plan, it would take at least one year. And that would give the world enough time uh, to respond. Many experts say that if all parties adhere to their pledges, the deal almost certainly could have achieved that goal for longer than a decade. So, you know, this, this uh, plan uh, was put into effect under the Obama administrations. And uh, if finally, uh, the, the you know, whole thing started moving with increased inspection of Iranian facilities uh, to uh, IAEA inspectors and uh, 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 which included surprise inspections as well. I mean, this is a very key point because surprise inspections always create uh, problems for the concerned country. Iran agreed not to produce either the highly enriched uranium or the plutonium that could be used in a nuclear weapon. It also took steps to ensure that its Fordo 
Natans and Arak facilities would pursue only civilian uh, 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 work like uh, peaceful uses of power generation, agriculture, medicine, etc., uh, industrial research. The accord limited the number and types of centrifuges Iran could operate, the level of its enrichment, as well as the size of its stockpile of enriched uranium. So uh, uh, there is the, the second was monitoring and verification. Iran agreed to eventually implement a protocol that would allow inspectors from IAEA unfettered access to its nuclear facilities and post potentially to undeclared sites. Uh, a body known as the Joint Commission, which included representatives of all the negotiating parties, monitored the implementation of the agreement and resolved disputes that may arise. A majority vote by its members could gain IAEA inspectors access to other sites which were of any of suspicious nature and uh, had not been declared. And in return, the EU, UN, and the US all committed to lifting their nuclear-related sanctions on Iran. However, many other US sanctions uh, still remained. So this went on, and then uh, January 26, 2018, the UN, uh, the, the IAEA, uh, issued its first quarterly report for 2018 on Iran's implementation of the JCPOA. Uh, and as of February 12, 2018, the quantity of Iran's enriched uranium enriched up to 3.67% uh, uh, to three of uranium 235 was 109.5 kilograms. So it, Iran was adhering uh, to the uh, uh, commitments that it made. Uh, however, uh, in the in the meantime, the uh, U.S. administration changed, and President Donald Trump took office, and he announced in May twenty eight. He, he announced in May 2018, uh, after the, you know, in, in his first uh, year, that he's withdrawing the United States from the JCPOA and signed a presidential memorandum to institute the highest level, quote unquote, of economic sanctions on Iran. In a statement, Secretary of State, uh, of, Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Munchen stated that sanctions will be reimposed subject to certain 90-day and 180-day wind-down periods. Now, what was the root cause of this action by the U.S. administration? You, the U.S. administration uh, maintained that Iran's, Iran had gotten scot-free uh, under the JCPOA because it was doing two other things which the international community did not want to happen. One was development of ballistic missiles and the other was support to terrorist groups. Now, these are two extraneous issues and uh, there was no reason why uh, this... Uh, and these other points should be raised by the U.S. administration. But that happened, and certain sanction measures reimposed by uh, Trump came into full effect. The measures including restricting Iran's purchase of U.S. dollars, trade in gold, precious metals, aluminum, steel, coal, software, and transactions related to sovereign debt and automotive sector were all uh, uh, under the purview of the sanctions. Now, change of administration again, and this time Biden came to office. Joe Biden, who is now still in, in uh, 
uh, the post uh, of president and he is running his own administration. They just announced that they are going to look again on this issue of Iran. And Jake Sullivan, Biden's national security advisor, said during a White House press conference that the administration is actively engaged with the European Union uh, right now in consultations on Iran. Uh, Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei says, during, said during an interview with the Iranian state media, that if the United States wants Iran to return to its commitments, it must lift all sanctions in practice. Then we will do verification and then we will return to our commitments. So the condition laid down by Iran was that all san sanctions must be lifted. Anthony Blinken affirmed that if Iran comes back into compliance with its obligations under the nuclear agreement, we would do the same. And he said that it would that would involve, if it came to that, that Iran made good on its obligations, considerable sanctions relief pursuant to the agreement. October 31st, 2021, U.S. President Joe Biden promised that the United States will return to the JCPOA so long as Iran does and assured that Washington will only abandon efforts to restore compliance if Tehran reneges on the deal. Uh, the negotiations continued, and then uh, during uh, in December 2022, during a biannual meeting on the implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 2231, U.S. Alternate Representative of the UN said that the UN Secretary General's failure to investigate evidence of Iran selling drones to Russia again an extraneous matter. Uh, in violation of Resolution 2231 is not acceptable, and there must be some degree of accountability for openly violating uh, resolutions of the Security Council. Therefore, the matter is now uh, in doldrums, and there is no uh, no uh, light at the end of the tunnel at, at, at this stage. So, uh, it, it seems that uh, uh, the uh, Biden administration is again uh, hesitating from taking uh, any positive steps regarding lifting of the sanctions. Uh, and Iran has also announced that it will continue with its uh, enrichment program uh, because it, it maintains that it needs enrichment of a higher level for medical purposes, uh, the radioisotopes used in uh, medicine, uh, in, in nuclear medicine, uh, need to be about up to 70% uh, enrichment. So uh, it seems that there is uh, not much uh, hope at the moment. However, uh, it is possible that uh, there could be some change. The real problem in the U.S. is the U.S. Congress. Uh, the U.S. Congress acting under the influence of many of the Israeli lobby, and uh, which is very powerful, and uh, the APAC, American Israel Political Action Committee. Uh, and uh, they, they, they uh, are preventing the members of the Congress of the both houses uh, to take any action uh, in alleviating the Iranian uh, uh, problems regarding sanctions. And the Iranians are also not uh, willing to uh, bow down or cater to their uh, demands. So that means that what has happened over the years is that the Iranian nuclear program has moved from uh, the IAEA uh, to uh, the broader political forum of P5 plus one. And there, a, a great deal of success was achieved under the JCPOA, but uh, it was revoked by the US in 2018. And now it's being, uh, the, the efforts are being, to, uh, are being made to revive it, but the outlook does not seem very promising at the moment. 
So this will be broad picture, the overall situation that I am placing before you. And I think I have taken up enough. So I will uh, now conclude. And I thank you, Fraz, for giving the opportunity. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, sir, for providing a holistic and historical approach uh, to Iranian nuclear program. And you quite rightly, <clears throat> quite rightly mentioned that it is quite ironic that the Iranian nuclear program was actually facilitated by the U.S. itself during the era of the Shah. And now after the revolution, it has become the source of concern of the U.S. itself. You also mentioned that a similar sort of negotiations took place during uh, 2003, in which EU participated uh, along with its three members. And then fast forward to 2015, when all the JCPO proceedings concluding, concluded. Um, uh, one last thing that you uh, pointed out that the real problem uh, in the uh, uh, the real problem why the JCPOA is not being revived right now is the U.S. Congress, in which uh, the Israeli lobby is quite prevalent and quite influential. So having said that, uh, now we uh, move forward to our second speaker who has joined us from uh, Iran, uh, Mr. Poya Mirzai. And uh, Mr. Poya uh, Mirzai is an editor-in-chief of Political Economy General, as well as Noor News English. He has also been teaching for more than 14 years and served as international affairs manager and journalist for more than eight years. Mr. Mirzai has been uh, working as an interpreter and columnist for reputed Iranian news agencies that involve Mehran news agencies as well as the Tehran Times. Mr. Poya would now be deliberating upon uh, the political role of IAEA in the GCPO proceedings. Over to you, sir. Uh, in the name of God, the Minister of Merciful, thank you very much for the time that you devoted to me to participate in this program. Uh, thank you for the broad and detailed, clear information that you gave on the, the history of relationship between Iran and international atomic energy agency. Um, let me a little bit go forward and speak about the, uh, the application, the political application of this entity in the relationship between Iran and uh, international, other international entities. Uh, one of the most important points that we shall consider mostly during the past two, three years uh, after American withdrawal from JCPOA is the role of International Atomic Energy Agency on postponement of the, uh, the dialogues and their role as a barrier, unfortunately, for a progress in the dialogues between Iran and uh, P P4, as we call it, plus one, because the United States at the moment is not in these uh, dialogues directly. If you look at the announcements of the, this agency, and uh, especially Mr. Grossi, um, when we see that we have reached to a peak in the dialogue with the West, uh, there used to be some new issues and new cases that have been aroused, particularly by Mr. Garossi. And if you try to find the track and documentation of these new issues, unfortunately, most of them can be tra traced uh, to the, as the gentleman mentioned, the Zionist lobby in American Congress, and the Zionist regime in Israel. Now, they try to open a new cases and most of their effort is to change the main way and the approach of the dialogues toward a kind of military program rather than a peaceful and civil program. But the case is very clear. Islamic Republic of Iran uh, has announced so many times, both based on the 
as we call it fitwa, based on our uh, religious basis, that um, Iran is not following up the path to reach nuclear weapon. This is very clear. In the other side, if you look at the, the general strategy of Iran military policies, you see that Iran is not, um, Iran's strategy is not based on nuclear weapons, any kind of nuclear weapon. But why uh, these points is, are not valuable for the international arena? It comes from the lack of confidence and uh, trust. The reality is that Iran does not have a kind of um, a form of trust to the international entities, mostly after uh, American withdrawal in 2018. And we shall not ignore the role of EU, European Union, you know, from 2018 until now, it's five years that they have tried to keep Iran inside this deal uh, without any useful step forward. As you may heard, they created a kind of economic path and mechanism that they call it INSTEX. And during these five years, nothing happened between Iran and the European Union through these mechanisms, these economic mechanisms. The other point regarding the agency is the role of agency actually all over the world in all the nuclear cases is a kind of a technical um, role. And they're actually watched up to acquire technical issues, not the political issues. But if you look at their approach towards Iran, you will find that their approach is completely political. And during the past year, more than a year, they have aroused new issues. They asked questions from Iran. They wanted Iran to respond to them to give some clear answers. And the reality is that Iran has always everything, answered the questions, but nothing happens. The only thing is new cases and new issues that they try to arouse. And as I told you, unfortunately, it's mostly because of the effects of the Zionists on them. Uh, this is not only my word, or this is not only Iranians' idea. If you look at some of European Union's diplomats and negotiators, you see that they believe that it, there are some, uh, some like some hands out of the path that interfering in the negotiation process. But from the Iranian side, as the gentleman mentioned, if you look, Iran is voluntary member of NPT. But if you look at the countries that are acquiring nuclear weapons, there are nine countries, and four of these nine are not the member of NPT. Israel, India, your country, Pakistan, and the North Korea that used to be, but they resigned and they withdrew from NPT. Uh, but one of the most complicated uh, surveillance systems uh, has been put and pushed on Iran through NPT, but this is completely voluntary. Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons, so it doesn't need to continue its membership in the NPT. This is an idea that some people inside Iran, some experts inside Iran, that they believe on this. But the Islamic Republic of Iran continues to show the confidence. But you see what is coming from the other side, they use this voluntary membership to put more and more surveillance on Iran. Uh, one important point, again, is from 2018 till now, 
The side that has been withdrawn from the JCPOA is the United States of America, not Iran. Iran is still inside this deal. Maybe according to the, the text of the deal, Iran has put some steps backward, but it is completely based on the deal. There is nothing uh, coming from out of the deal that Iran uh, tried to enter inside the negotiations. But look at the other side. There are some humanitarian issues, human rights issues. There are some issues regarding Iran's uh, military progress. There are some issues regarding Iran's foreign policy progress. All of them have been used as a kind of instrument or leverage inside the negotiations. And the agency, International Atomic Energy Agency, surprisingly has played a very, very broad role for using such a kind of non-related issues in the negotiations. At the end, if you let me, uh, I want to give a, a very brief introduction of the people of Iran, their opinion about the whole situation. Uh, as the gentleman mentioned, the Iranian nuclear program is not a newly program. Uh, it has been started during the, the monarchy regime, the former regime. And as you go and try to find the information in the in media at that time, there were two barriers for Iran, two forbidden points again for Iran, requiring nuclear weapons and high level enrichment. So it, it's not related to the Islamic Republic of Iran, actually. It's something that is forbidden for Iran. And the people of Iran somehow are thinking that why it should be like this why we should be forbidden uh, from acquiring any kind of weapon. If these kind of weapons are forbidden, it must be forbidden for everyone. And if they're not forbidden, why it's only forbidden for us. And the next point is high level enrichment. You know, maybe these days you hear about the 60% enrichment of uranium inside Iran. All the experts, and technicals and scientists, they know that this is very inevitable for some kind of batteries, for some kind of propulsion systems. It's, it's not related to the, the military aspect, but the agency wants to try to use this as a leverage. But the Iranian people, they think that it is a kind of their right. They have spent their national treasure, their money, on this program for many decades, and they don't believe that they should stop it. No one inside Iran is believing on stopping the progress of this um, industry in Iran. But the reality is that in the other side, the conservatives in the United States, the Zionists inside America and in the Israel, they think that they should somehow stop this industry, the actual stalemate comes from here. And Iranian people also think that why agency is not taking any role against the sabotage that somehow sometimes come from the Israeli side, the Zionist side. Uh, for example, if you look at the, the conflict in Ukraine, and there were some issues with some nuclear power plants, mostly in uh, Zaporozhia, if I uh, pronounce the name right. And the agency tried to play a very active role. And they said, OK, this is something harmful for environment, for people around. But no one says the Israeli actions against Iranian facilities is harmful for people, for Iranian people for the environment. And although for the other countries around, the, the gentlemen who are experts, they know if something catastrophic happened, uh, there would be a very, very severe situation around 2,000, 3,000 kilometers. 3,000 kilometer 
around Iran, you know, it is Israel itself inside, it is Egypt. In the other side, it's Pakistan, it's Afghanistan. And no one is worried about the, the Israeli actions about Iranian facilities. And this is something that we are thinking about here. And we try to judge agency with these kind of actions. Thank you very much for the time that you devoted to me. If there would be any question, I'm ready to answer all the questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Poya, for your uh, uh, comprehensive deliberation on the Iranian nuclear program. So you uh, pointed out that uh, the main problem is that uh, there should be a principal st stance among the world community that if any one particular country is not allowed to have the nuclear weapons, so it is applicable to all the other uh, countries as well. Then you also mentioned that many a times uh, there, there have been concerns regarding the Iranian nuclear facilities, but no one is concerned about the attacks that Iran has been facing on its nuclear side by the by by the by, by Israel. So uh, th this was the main gist of uh, your uh, your speech. So now moving on to our last but not the least speaker uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali uh, Sayyid Muhammad Ali is a well-known international security analyst and he has represented Pakistan in various international platforms and negotiations that include uh, that happened in US, China, India, UK, Austria, and Turkey. Uh, he has also authored several books, chapters, research papers, and articles. Uh, his policy and academic work has been widely published and cited by the leading think tank, the think tanks that include Brookings Institute, uh, IISS, ISIS, Stimson Center and the Palm. Um, he has also presented uh, his papers in various uh, internationally recognized journals like the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Non-Proliferation Review, IISS Military Balance, and others. So today he'll be speaking on the geopolitics and the Iranian nuclear program. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Faraz. Um, I am grateful to... Um... Institute of Regional Studies, uh, yourself, Mr. Fraz, and the leadership, uh, Ambassador Riaz as well, uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to uh, share my views on a very interesting and important uh, subject of global and regional uh, interest and significance. <clears throat> um, I think uh, we've already had a very comprehensive and insightful uh, two perspectives. So what I'll try to do in the next 15 minutes uh, is to frame uh, the, Indian, the Iranian nuclear program uh, in a geopolitical context and try to piece together a simpler picture <clears throat> so that everybody can understand. Um, I'll present a realist uh, and academic perspective. So when you look at the Iranian nuclear program, there are five dimensions that need to be considered. Uh, we've heard the diplomatic aspects, the uh, technical and the legal aspects, but there's more to it uh, which deserves attention and deeper reflection. There are five dimensions. There's a legal dimension of the nuclear program. There's a political significance. There's an economic significance. And then there's a technological aspect. And last but not the least, the security aspect. So I think uh, the legal aspect has been uh, adequately covered by Ambassador Nakwi, um, in which he mentioned the uh, NPT uh, commitments that uh, Iran has made uh, to the international community according to international law and uh, the growing expectations of the international community, particularly uh, of the Western powers, uh, but uh, spearheaded by IEAs, uh, growing demands uh, regarding transparency and restraint uh, from Iran. But that's the legal aspect. Uh, what I argue is that the legal aspect is, as has been uh, mentioned by the two learned speakers before me, is not independent of the political, economic, technological, and security dimensions. That is what uh, is very important. So uh, in terms of the political aspect, I think that is perhaps the most significant. And why is that? It's because uh, at the global and the regional level, the changes which are um, swiftly afoot uh, in the world order, also in the Middle East, uh, have had a significant impact 
uh, on the Iranian nuclear program and how it is perceived regionally and internationally. I think uh, it will be inappropriate for me not to point out the recent, a very historic uh, development which has taken place uh, that China facilitated um, a major peace agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I think that will be uh, a very significant geopolitical development. And that reflects that China uh, is positioning itself in the Middle East as a major uh, global peace broker, uh, which will reduce um, and, and challenge the dominance of the Western powers um, in the Middle East. So that is very important. And uh, because uh, when you look at in the geopolitical context, it is uh, uh, quite apparent that uh, since 1979, for the last 44 years, um, Iran uh, was uh, facing a, a threat of diplomatic uh, isolation, economic strangulation, and uh, also military and other um, threats. So uh, as has been rightly pointed out, the Iranian nuclear program itself started uh, with the US help in the 1950s uh, as a result of the Atoms for Peace program. But how the Iranian nuclear program was perceived uh, after 1979 uh, fundamentally and radically changed. And that uh, led to a Western policy of technological denial and coercion, uh, which Iran has faced till today. So that is the context in which we need to see the whole developments. But what has happened that uh, uh, the attempts to stop or reduce or harm the growing technological capability of the Iranian nuclear program um, has uh, used both kinetic, diplomatic and non-kinetic uh, means. When you look at the diplomatic aspect, obviously the coercion has been there, but JCPOA as has been pointed out by Ambassador Nakwi, uh, provided a win-win situation for both uh, Iran and the, and, and the rest of the world, because it offered economic relief in return for uh, technological restraint from uh, Iran. However, uh, due to the change in government in the US, the US unilaterally withdrew uh, from JCPOA. Uh, but the other uh, uh, parties, which include uh, uh, Russia, China, Britain, France, and Germany, uh, are still committed and expect uh, Iran to remain committed to this deal. But the geopolitics is more significant than these uh, legal and diplomatic aspects because, uh, you know, the recent Ukraine war brought uh, Russia and Iran together very close to each other, also in terms of the security cooperation. Also, uh, there are reports of very significant historic economic in, uh, trade and investment between Beijing and Tehran. So what has happened in uh, reality is that the weight, the bite, and the effect of uh, the US sanctions on Iran have been somewhat circumvented and reduced uh, by the recent global and regional changes. At the global level, you see China becoming emerging as a major uh, importer of uh, uh, Iranian oil. Uh, I was reading as part of my research um, that uh, Russia and Iran have been collaborating significantly in defense cooperation. And there are reports that uh, 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 Russia uh, might soon provide Iran with very high tech uh, 24 Su-35 fighter bombers, which will significantly, uh, once it happens, improve uh, Iran's air defense capability and reduce the possibility and risk of uh, any uh, air strike against its uh, nuclear installations. So, uh, and in case of China, uh, I was uh, uh, reading the recent reports of the Iranian oil exports. Uh, if you look at uh, the time when JCPOA came into effect, mm -hmm. Uh, according to open source assessments, uh, Iran was uh, exporting around 2.5 million barrels of oil per day uh, in 2018. But after Mr. Trump 
uh, administration withdrew unilaterally from JCPOA. Uh, and, and, you know, it had a huge economic impact on the Iranian economy. And according to open source reports, uh, from 2.5 million barrels per day, the exports dwindled to less than 500,000 barrels per day. That was a huge dent in the uh, Iranian um, export revenue. But what has happened recently, uh, in the last uh, few three, four months, the recent reports indicate that uh, China has emerged as a major buyer of uh, Iranian oil. And there are reports of uh, more than 1 million barrels per day being procured from Iran. So what does all this mean? This means that the Western attempt to coerce Iran economically, to force it to reduce its technological development in the nuclear field have been circumvented and eroded by growing uh, cooperation between Iran, uh, China, and Russia. So that indicates that Iran is uh, very tactfully um, using the emerging opportunities in the transformation of the world order and benefiting from uh, its growing economic cooperation and energy cooperation with uh, China and military and security cooperation with Russia. Uh, so that is how I see geopolitics affecting uh, the Iranian nuclear program and reducing the effect of uh, the Western sanctions on Iranian nuclear program. Now let's come to the uh, technical side, which is very important. And for the benefit of your uh, audience, according to India, uh, I'll just uh, share some facts which are internationally known. Uh, notwithstanding the popular uh, and somewhat uh, shallow debate whether Iran is in violation of IEA and JCPOA or not, the reality is that Iran's technical capabilities uh, uh, in terms of nuclear technology are growing and they are advancing, not just quantitatively, but also qualitatively. Now, uh, that is a reality which IAEA also recognizes. That does not tend to amount to necessarily violation of IAEA safeguards. But the fact is, as uh, Mr. Poya pointed out, uh, according to NPT obligations, uh, Iran has a sovereign right to uh, pursue and promote and advance its nuclear program for peaceful purposes, as long as it remains committed to that uh, obligation, uh, according to NPT. And so far, uh, it has uh, not to, uh, given any indication that it has violated the NPT obligations. That is the most uh, important thing. Uh, the second aspect is, in terms of the technological aspect, there are reports that the current um, enrichment, uh, the three enrichment facilities, um, which include the Natanz and the Fardo, uh, offer Iran uh, more than 18,300 separative work unit of enrichment capacity, uh, which is far more than what it had um, at the time of JCPOA. So uh, that is the quantitative development. Second is the qualitative development, the design and the sophistication of the centrifuges have also improved remarkably, and uh, which indicates the capacity of its enrichment facilities has not just quantitatively, but qualitatively improved. What it means, basically, according to a recent ISIS report, uh, the, in only in the last few years, last three years, the centrifuges which have been produced are quantitatively uh, less uh, perhaps, uh, you know, 2,782 uh, sophisticated advanced centrifuges and 7,100 uh, centrifuges which are of IRI uh, design in Ferdo. But the capacity of the later, uh, more advanced and sophisticated centrifuges, which are at Natanz, uh, to produce, uh, I mean, to enrich uranium is uh, much faster and much more advanced than the older uh, um, designs. So what I'm saying is that uh, Iran has, uh, uh, you know, tactfully used its access uh, uh, to international cooperation under NPT obligations and also developed its own um, enrichment uh, 
technology um, qualitatively, even if it does not violate the number of uh, centrifuges that it has. What it means is, uh, in terms of strategic capacity, its breakout capacity uh, period has been reduced significantly. If you look at uh, Iran's uh, breakout period, uh, it would have taken it perhaps a year in 2015. Today, it would take a few days. Now, what does this mean? Now, I'm not saying that that means that uh, Iran is going to produce nuclear weapons, but it is a reality that its ability, once and if it decides, uh, it will take much less effort and it will take much less time. That is an objective technical reality. Now, let's come to the most interesting part, which is the security aspect. Now, there are three uh, aspects of the security aspect. Number one, uh, Israel obviously seems to be the most concerned and perturbed uh, player in the Middle East um, regarding the uh, Iranian nuclear program and has not shied away from uh, threatening to take it out as well. Uh, also, the Iranian nuclear program has received threats uh, in both kinetic and non-kinetic uh, means. That includes, you would recall, the... Um, uh, Stuxnet uh, cyber attack that it faced that had a huge impact on the Iranian nuclear program. Also, there are reports of uh, several uh, Iranian nuclear scientists and engineers being assassinated uh, through different means recently. Uh, also, um, there are reports that uh, some people have been abducted and, 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 you know, there are other ways to disrupt the program which have been attempted. Now, uh, only recently, the largest ever US-Israeli um, Air Force uh, uh, exercise was held in which the US uh, strategic bombers like B-52s also participated. Um, and I'm sure Tehran views that with concern. However, uh, the recent deal that you have witnessed that uh, Saudi Arabia has signed thanks to the facilitation of Beijing might reduce uh, the th threat perception of Tehran regarding the Arab world. And this would obviously be seen with concern both in Washington and uh, Tel Aviv that uh, they expected uh, Arabs to you know, be concerned about the Iranian nuclear program. But only today, earlier in the morning, I was reading reports that uh, the Saudi and the Iranian foreign minister are going to talk shortly uh, in order to uh, <clears throat> uh, reopen their embassies. And there is also more uh, positive news that the, one of the senior members of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Iran has said that they are already uh, considering developing a joint uh, Chamber of Commerce between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now, these things, what do the, these things mean for the Iranian nuclear program? It obviously reduces the threat uh, of not just uh, physical harm, but also of isolation, both in economic and diplomatic dimensions that Iran has faced for the last 44 years. So this means that the attempts to isolate Iran diplomatically, economically, technically, technologically uh, are not proving very successful. And Iran, at, on one hand, is uh, improving its security relations with uh, Russia, economic and energy cooperation with uh, uh, China, and trade relations, reviving them with the Arab world as well. So uh, this will uh, you know, mean that uh, the concern that uh, Iranian nuclear program uh, has been uh, uh, seen with uh, might reduce in the Arab world and uh, because the threats and the um, challenges will reduce. So it is very important that these developments should be seen um, in a comprehensive lens rather than looking at it only from the legal um, and, and technological aspect. Last but not the least, uh, one of you, uh, very few security aspects which would be of interest to your audience. Uh, Look, what option does Israel have as a devil's advocate against Iranian nuclear program? Uh, if they try to take it out, 
technically it, it, it may not be possible for three reasons number one when you look at the first there are two routes one is the enrichment program the second is the uh, reactor so you can't take out all the facilities at the same time plus there are three major enrichment plants um, in Natanz and Fardo and the most significant one uh, like the Fardo are deeply buried underground so they may not be easy even if they attempt uh, uh, you know uh, some irresponsible action against the Iranian nuclear sites to actually achieve um, uh, you know, uh, a destruction of these. Um, secondly, I earlier mentioned if uh, Iran procures the Su-35, uh, which is a very advanced um, uh, 4.5 generation fighter aircraft, uh, then I'm sure um, it will be seen, it will uh, uh, draw a lot of respect from the Iranian adversaries uh, in terms of air defense capability. Uh, also, uh, because uh, if um, any such attempt is made against Iranian nuclear program uh, in terms of airstrike or anything, it will provide Iran the perfect justification, as Mr. Poya rightly pointed out, to exit NPT on the basis of national security challenges and go down the uh, development of uh, strategic deterrent, uh, which uh, you know, is not very far off in terms of technical capacity. So I am laying down before your audience all the dimensions and real aspects of the Iranian nuclear program, which are being considered around the world, which is why, let me conclude by saying, there are no bad options if the international community in general and the Western uh, powers and Israel in particular expect Iran to show restraint besides diplomacy. Diplomacy is the only way to resolve uh, issues and achieve uh, mutual interest through peaceful means. And uh, I don't think the kinetic or uh, any other options uh, will work. The coercion is increasingly ineffective. The economic isolation is also not working. So the world is changing and I think it offers great peaceful uh, and profitable opportunities to uh, the region, to Iran, and also to Pakistan, perhaps. Um, uh, for our own, we can uh, consider exploring Iran as a uh, viable export market for our products and also improving our bilateral trade that will help provide and offer relief for our own economic challenges. With those few words, I thank you, Mr. Faraz, and Institute of Regional Studies for sharing my uh, views on this very interesting and important topic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Muhammad Ali. It was quite a fascinating uh, viewpoint that you uh, highlighted. Uh, you quite structurally pointed out five dimensions of the Iranian nuclear program, starting from legal, then political, economic, technological, and most sort of mentioned security aspect. And you also mentioned that apart from all of the, uh, the political side is quite important in understanding the diplomatic For I hope know, I am audible to all of you. Yes. Uh, so it was an internet breakdown. So uh, Mr. Ali quite rightly pointed out the five uh, dimensions of Iranian nuclear program. And at the last, uh, you mentioned that any um, disruptive act against the Iranian nuclear facility might provide Iran the chance to, uh, might provide Iran the excuse to basically withdraw from NPT and it would be catastrophic for the entire diplomatic engagement that has been uh, going on between IAEA, Iran and the West. So having said that, I quickly move to the question answer session and I know that Ambassador Ali Sarwar Nakvi uh, has to leave for another meeting. So my first uh, question would be directed 
to Mr. Mohammed, Mr. Ambassador Ali Sarwan Nakwi. And uh, this question is uh, from Dr. Kaval Hayat from uh, Lahore Garrison University. And she asked Ambassador that, uh, how would you see that Iran might be able to satisfy the concerns of IAEA of not enriching uranium beyond 60% considering the geopolitical scenario that has been unfolding in the globe? Uh, sir, you are muted. He is muted. Uh, yes, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, the geopolitical uh, scenario that has been just now uh, uh, dwelt upon and explained uh, is very complex. So, I mean, Iran uh, should, of course, abide by its commitments under both the NPT and the IAEA statute. However, uh, it's not a level playing field. Iran has always had certain reservations about the treatment that Iran as an individual country has been given uh, as against uh, many other countries uh, which have not been treated uh, with the same stringency. So I think uh, uh, the, the, you see, at the base of all international relations is the fact that every country is sovereign. And that under international law gives that country the right to do what it considers to be the best in its own national interest. Therefore, from that observation, I'll draw the, uh, the, 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 the further uh, conclusion that Iran remains sovereign and is a sovereign state which uh, is essentially committed to its national interest. And therefore, all the other uh, matters like its obligations under the NPT and its uh, commitment to the IAEA statute uh, take uh, second, sec, uh, second place. Uh, I think uh, Iran will do what is best for its own interests and uh, the IAEA uh, cannot compel it to uh, uh, do things that uh, it may not wish to do. Recently, there is this the, the report. There are reports, in fact, that the inspectors uh, are having trouble going to Iran. Uh, DG Rafael Grossi has recently also visited Iran. So he has tried to work out an arrangement with the Iranian authorities for the inspectors to go there. Uh, so, uh, this is a perennial issue that will continue and uh, Iran will do only what it thinks is right for itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind remarks. Uh, the second question uh, from the audience is, uh, uh, is asked by Ms. Zara, and the question is directed to Mr. Poya. Sir, uh, she's asking that uh, we all know that the Iranian nuclear deal, if it happens and if it is revived, we all know that it would be beneficial for Iran itself. But how do you see that the this nuclear agreement would entail benefits for the Western and European interests, considering the uh, Russia-Ukraine war that has been going on? Uh, thank you very much. If I rightly could right understand, you mean that what would be the interest of progress in Iranian nuclear program for the Western side? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Precisely. Uh, the question is that what is the, the, the interest of other countries nuclear program for the West? You know, such questions, gentlemen, or such attitude toward Iran. Um, I'm so sorry that I'm speaking frankly. Uh, is not recognizable for us. Uh, 
what there shall be the interest, this is something related to our national interest, national security. But definitely, if I want to clarify, there would be some, um, some I have to call it like a subsidiary, like a side interest, if they facilitate the relationship with Iran. You can see Saudi Arabia, for more than seven years, they tried to do lots of bad things against Iran, their hired mercenaries, they try to interfere inside the Iranian situation. And then they reached to this point that cooperation with Iran would benefit them. The benefit for Western countries comes from generally cooperation. But if you want to ask, okay, a, we should have a interest for Western side to let us to progress our nuclear industries. It's, I'm sorry, a little bit ridiculous. Uh, if is not, uh, there is not any other questions, I have five points to clarify if you let me. Mr. Faraz, is there any uh, yes, other sir, question? You so, uh, uh, sir, questions. Uh, th there are many questions, but you may continue. So, let me clarify these five points. But after what, if there would be any more questions, I'm at your service. Uh, thank you very much for the the um, bringing is something like a geopolitical and as I call it, geostrategic aspect to the situation. Uh, but before that, I want to say, when we say um, the other side, mostly Europeans, are committed to the deal, uh, again, we don't understand what is the commitment to the deal. As I mentioned, they tried to make a new uh, economic mechanism for Iran, but nothing happened. What is this commitment? Only um, claiming that they are inside the deal. Is it something really beneficial for Iran? If we look at fundamentally to the JCPOA, why JCPOA happened? It happened in order to bring some limits on Iran and in front of that, give some interest in some other side, mostly economic. The, the, the most important point at the moment for the the, the Iranian national interest is the economic development. We know that we have some problem inside our economy. And because of the history, because of our economy is based on oil and oil products, um, some of the problems comes from the, the interaction and the trade with other countries. So it was the, the realistic base for JCPOA. When we say Europeans were committed, to tell the truth, we don't understand it. From our side of view, no one was committed to Iran. The second point, if you want to look at the, the geopolitical aspect, you know, um, unfortunately, my academic affiliation is geopolitics, political geography. Uh, when we say geopolitics, we are thinking about purely realistic view. And if you want to continue more, we reach to, in this point, we reach to a kind of a geostrategic aspect that is related to our national security, although it may be theoretical. Look at the, the map. In a radius of 3,000 kilometers, three out of nine countries possessing nuclear weapons are around Iran. And if we look again in a radius of 2,000 kilometer, two out of three, out of nine are around Iran, Israel and Pakistan. So when you force Iran that you should not have any kind of nuclear program, what does it mean for us? It means that maybe once in a blue moon something happened and we want you with a tight hand. This is the way that I think it's completely rational. Any other country, they, when they want to look at the situation and when they want to assess the situation, they look at it in this way. But no one outside Iran tries to, uh, to look at these points. 
for any other nationalities and countries, their national security comes first. But when, when we reach to Iran, lots of things comes first. And then we think about Iran's national security related to those lots of things. Um, the next point, sometimes some expert inside Iran, they look at North and Korea. What they did, they had some operation, nuclear weapon operation, the long range missile operation. And Donald Trump said that I'm ready to start a kind of dialogue with you. This is another point that some people are thinking about it. You know, when you put your feet in Iran's step, maybe it will be more realistic and although more rational for you to think about the issues like this. And about the Iranians withdrawal from NPT is catastrophic. This is another point that we don't understand. As I mentioned, four countries out of nine are not inside the NPT. Why it's not catastrophic? Why Iran's uh, withdrawal from NPT is catastrophic? What does it mean? Israel is not committed. No one knows exactly how many nuclear warhead weapons do they have. There are some experts here, some scientists and technicals and diplomats. Is there anyone to know that exactly how many nuclear weapons do they have? No one knows. And they are staying in around 2000 kilometers distance from Iran. They're using everything to make some operations against Iran. And we don't know how many nuclear weapons do they have. And they are out of NPT and no one says it's catastrophic. And the last point is about inspectors. According to my information, let me clarify, the, the, the agency inspectors are not prohibited to come to Iran. There were some steps backward after American withdrawal. And these steps were exactly from the inside text of JCPOA. And according to these steps, some access points have been restricted. It doesn't mean that they have problem for coming to Iran. They can come to Iran, they can inspect some, some of the facilities, but there were some more facilities, and to tell you the truth, for your information, all of them were voluntary, that they have been restricted. I'm at for service. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Poya, for clarifying your points and give us uh, the insight to the Iranian perspective of how all these nuclear diplomacy is going on and what are the Iranian concerns regarding it, uh, considering particularly the, uh, the Israeli nuclear program that has been going on um, for, uh, uh, for quite many years. And it is quite secretive that no one knows about the actual number of the nukes that Israel possesses. So we are really running short of time, but before that, we have uh, two uh, last questions. Uh, one question is asked by Mr. T. A. Bhutta, and I believe it is directed by Mr. Muhammad Ali, sir. Uh, she, uh, he asked that uh, the the recent geopolitical development, specifically the rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, how would you see that Saudi Arabia would negotiate with Iran on the nuclear front? Because as we all know, that the two countries in the region who were really apprehensive to the JCPOA were number one Israel and number two Saudi Arabia. So how do you see that considering this rapprochement, the nuclear diplomacy would, uh, uh, would be going on between these two uh, regional countries in Saudi Arabia? Am I audible, sir?
Whereas there is no response. Okay, so uh, Hello. Uh, yeah. let, can, let, can let me move. Me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. We, we can hear you now. We can yeah. hear you now, sir. Okay, I was saying that uh, I think uh, Mr. Poya can give a more accurate answer about what uh, would be the likely agenda uh, of the talks between Riyadh and uh, Tehran. However, my objective uh, initial assessment is that it would be premature to expect that uh, immediately after the resumption of uh, formal diplomatic ties and opening of these, they would immediately start talking about Iranian nuclear program. That is unrealistic. I think there'll be baby steps. They'll initially try to reduce the distrust and, and build gradually relations. Perhaps there'll be more talk on economy and, and, and trade. Uh, I don't think uh, major security concerns would be uh, on the table immediately at the outset. But that's my initial thought. I think Mr. Poya can give a more accurate answer because he, he is in Iran. Mr. Poya, uh, do you have something to add on this uh, comment? Yes, you know, uh, the situation between Iran and Saudi Arabia is, um, I mean, uh, the nuclear program, Iranian nuclear program is not at the, uh, the high level agenda. There are lots of things between Iran and Saudi Arabia that must be facilitated and escalated, as the gentleman mentioned. But uh, there is something amazing and interesting, let me inform you, that from the mm, two or three days after they, they announced their, their agreement, some officials from Saudi, uh, something like Saudi Atomic Energy Organization or something equivalent, uh, they contacted Iranian Atomic Energy Organization and they said, we are ready to cooperate and use your your technology and your how now to develop our nuclear program. And Iran is, is, is completely open to this situation. Uh, well analyzed, sir. Uh, so we are really short of time. So before concluding, I would like uh, uh, Ambassador Nadim Riaz, the president of Institute of Regional Studies, Islamabad, to give his uh, concluding and thank you remarks. Uh, thank you, Faraz. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it was uh, very interesting listening to all the honorable speakers. And it was a good uh, interactive uh, question answer session. Uh, this is a subject which is of importance. It's a subject uh, where uh, I think a lot of uh, information and knowledge is required to understand it fully and to and to really comprehend what is going on uh, because it's something which is important. And uh, I think it was aptly uh, put forward by the speakers in their in their presentations, uh, the complexity of the entire issue. And uh, from my side, I would like to thank everyone for their participation, for, um, for at least enabling a person like me to understand a very complex issue. I, I honestly feel that uh, we need to have uh, more sessions on this particular subject because it has got its intricacies and it has got its, uh, I would say, complexities, which need to be understood because little knowledge, as they say, is a dangerous thing, because especially with nuclear issues, you need to be very, very uh, calculated in the language which is because the, the meaning can change just by putting a prefix or a, or, 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 or a word of out of context. Compliments to everyone for uh, for uh, uh, elaborating on this particular subject. And uh, Faraz, I hope that you will organize another session um, in continuation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining us during the month of Ramadan. Over and out from my side. Over to you, Faraz. Thank you, sir.
Uh, thank you so much, thank sir, you. for your uh, for your concluding remarks, and I thank all the speakers, Ambassador Ali Sarwar Nakvi, who has now left for another meeting, but uh, for his participation, uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali, for uh, for uh, quite aptly uh, analyzing the entire geopolitical situation and uh, Mr. Poya Mirzai who has joined us from all the way from Tehran. I thank you all the speakers and the participants uh, for joining us and hopefully in the future too we will continue this series and would invite the speakers as well again. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, uh, Ross. Thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak about the issue. Thank you. Thank you.